Tonight on the Worldview Weekend Hour, Brainwashed America, the systematic steps for how the American people have been brainwashed over many decades to assist and go along with the cultural Marxist revolution almost complete in the United States of America. The Worldview Weekend Hour begins right now. WVW-TV presents the Worldview Weekend Hour with Brandon House. Whether the topic is law, science, government, economics, history, family, social issues, education, or theology, Brennan brings the issues of today into clear focus through the lens of a biblical worldview. And now, here is your host, Brennan House. Good evening and welcome to the Worldview Weekend Hour. Tonight we start a brand new series on Brainwashed America. The subtitle is The Systematic Process and Historical Documented Facts of How the Vast Majority of Americans Have Been Brainwashed Over Many Decades to Embrace and Assist in the Cultural Marxist Revolution That Is Almost Complete Within the United States of America. Well, this is a very important series because many people don't know that there has been an information operation or a brainwashing operation, information war, psychological warfare, all these different various titles for the same thing. They, they don't realize this has been going on. And one of the reasons that brainwashing is so successful on a people and a nation is because they don't know what's going on. You see, that's the nature of deception. People don't often know they're being deceived. And those who perpetrate brainwashing don't want to name it. They don't want to identify its tactics, and they don't want people to know about it. Because if they do, then they can resist. Over the last couple of years, and more recently, the last few months, I have been studying this topic of brainwashing. What first alerted me to the importance of this topic was a report put out in 1956 um, by, and actually it was a speech given in 1956 by William E. Mayer, who's on the screen here. William E. Mayer wrote a book called Beyond the Call, and he was tapped with studying what happened to our POWs during the Korean War. During the Korean War, we had our POWs in record numbers, giving up, pulling the sheets over their head, and dying. In addition to that, many of them were not resisting the communist propaganda that was being fed to them. And when they came home, those that survived, one of the key things they said was, if we had only known, if we had only known what was going on, if we had only been prepared for what was occurring, we could have resisted it, but they didn't know. And Dr. William E. Mayer and a group of other uh, experts studied this sad situation of our POWs in the Korean War. And this is what led to the code of conduct that our United States military began to teach American soldiers. The code of conduct. What would be expected of them should they be taken prisoner? Should they become a prisoner of war? What were they to do? How were they to resist? Were they they indeed supposed to be actively engaged in trying to escape? These very important tactics were taught to them because of what happened to the POWs during the Korean War. William E. Mayer gave a speech, as I said, in uh, November. In fact, it was November 27th, 1956. And I have it here in front of me, and I've played clips of it on the radio. And what I did was I took this speech and I began to go through it and I began to mark it up and I began to make notes in the the margins of this speech. And I began to break down what he was saying and then to uh, take my uh, journal with blank pages, as I am prone to do, and to begin to make a list of what was it he was saying. In other words, I just made an outline of what he was saying. Maybe the outline isn't his exact words, but it's the ideas that he was presenting. And then I began to break it down into an outline so I might understand what were the systematic steps that he was talking about. Because he didn't lay out any systematic steps. He didn't say one, two, three, four, five and lay it out. He just wrote about what was happening. I then, wanting a list 
so that I could easily understand it and explain it to others, compiled what you're going to see tonight. But he's not the only one. William E. Mayer was just one of at least two people that I have been reading who have studied this extensively. The other individual is a man by the name of William Hunter. Edward, excuse me, Edward Hunter. Edward Hunter was a journalist uh, and he testified before the Committee on Un-American Activities in 1958. And it is there that he uh, was said to have served during uh, two years, two years he served during, the war, during World War II as a, quote, propaganda specialist, end quote, for the Office of Strategic Services, which was the forerunner to the Central Intelligence Agency. And in March of 58, as he testified before the U.S. House of Representatives uh, House Committee on Un-American Activities, he described what happened particularly to the Chinese people during the Communist Revolution of 1949. So please understand, we're talking about two different reports by two different men. The one by William E. Mayer, his speech from 1956 and his book called Beyond the Call, was to study the POWs of the Korean War. Edward Hunter, he gave a speech and he did a lot of studying and writing in regards to what happened to the Chinese people when the communists took over with their revolution in China in 1949. Both of these men studying two different groups of people, but both of them studying the tactics of the communist and how they brainwash a people. As we go through this study, we will use both of these men and their research as examples of how I believe the people of China and the communist revolution of China in 1949 and the brainwashing of our American POWs during the Korean War, have, I believe, become the uh, basis upon which an information operation has been carried out in America. Information operation is another name for brainwashing. It's also known as misinformation. Now, an information operation can at times be done for good reasons. If our government goes in and takes over a nation that has not lived under liberty and freedom, they will try to uh, send forth the information to the people through flyers and pamphlets and, and uh, local people, recognize people in their culture to explain what we're here to do, to liberate them and to give them freedom and liberty and that they need to organize and, and embrace a, a, a new kind of nation that offers up a new opportunity of freedom. And so they go about what they would call in the military an information operation, but using it for a, a good reason. But more than not, information operations are associated with brainwashing techniques. It's also, as I said, called a propaganda war, psychological ops, and more. Why is this so important? Because, again, if people don't know they're being deceived, then how can they fight the deception? If they don't name the program, how can they oppose it? And again, that's what our POWs said when they came home. If we had only known, if someone had only taught us what it is they would do to us or try to do to us, we could have resisted. Well, what is the definition of brainwashing? Merriam-Webster Dictionary has this definition of brainwashing. A forcible indoctrination to induce someone to give up basic political, social, or religious beliefs and attitudes, and to accept contrasting regimented ideas. Also, persuasion by propaganda or salesmanship. Notice it says that brainwashing includes the, the attempt to change someone's beliefs, their attitudes, and it can be done by the persuasion of propaganda. Now, some might say, well, isn't that what you're about, Brandon? Aren't you trying to change people's attitudes and beliefs or feelings? Indeed, we are, but we don't use propaganda. We don't use deception. We don't seek to manipulate people, to deceive people. That's a big difference. We desire for people to understand truth, to be set free from the lies of the culture, of the world, to be set free from the brainwashing. So there's a big difference between changing someone's attitudes, values, feelings, and beliefs with a good purpose and using the truth and not being manipulative 
and one that indeed uses lies, manipulation, and other tactics to change someone's attitudes, values, feelings, and beliefs in a way that is harmful to them and to society. So this is the definition of brainwashing according to the uh, Webster Dictionary. Now, here is another definition of brainwashing. This is from the Psychological Dictionary. A method that manipulates and modifies a person's emotions, attitudes, and beliefs. It utilizes intensely per persuasive, even coercive tactics in order to enforce these changes. Again, we don't set out to be manipulative or to manipulate someone's emotions or attitudes or to, to force anything on them. Now, where did the term brainwashing come from? Well, the term brainwashing has largely been connected, as I said earlier, to the 1949 communist revolution in China. Now, there are some reports that the term brainwashing was used prior to this, but it was after the 1949 revolution by the communists in China that the word really picked up steam. Here is the book by Edward Hunter, published in 1958, called Brainwashed. And as I said earlier, Hunter served for two years as a propaganda specialist for the Office of Strategic Services during World War II. He goes on to write in that book, Brainwashed, the new word, Harmosh wash, which is again a Chinese word, the word harmy washing entered our minds and dictionaries in a phenomenally short time. This sinister political expression had never been seen in print anywhere until a few years ago. The word came out of the sufferings of the Chinese people, put under a terrifying combination of subtle and crude uh, mental and physical pressures and tortures, they detected a pattern and called it brainwashing. The Reds wanted people to believe that it could be amply described or aptly described by some familiar expression such as education, public relations, persuasion, or by some misleading term like mind reform or re-education. None of these could define it because it was much, much more than anyone of them alone. The Chinese knew they hadn't just been educated or persuaded. Something much more dire than that had been perpetrated on them, similar in many peculiar ways to a medical treatment. What they had undergone was more like witchcraft, with its incantations, trances, poisons, and potions, with a strange flair of science about it all like a devil dancer in a tuxedo carrying his magic brew in a test tube. The communist hierarchy preferred people to believe that there was no such thing as brainwashing. So long as they could keep it concealed without a name, opposition to it could be kept scattered and ineffective. The German-born uh, Singlog Max Perlberg, who is fluent in both modern and classical Chinese, told me that the term might well have been derived from the Buddhist expression heart washing, which goes to the time of Min Sheas, a middle aged man, perhaps weary of worldly care, living in a bare pavilion in some placid corner of his garden, leaving his offspring to attend to his business. Well, if you do a little research on uh, Min Xiaz, Min Xiaz is said to be a Chinese philosopher who is often described as the second sage, that is, after the Confucius, uh, after only Confucius himself. Well, isn't that interesting that the Chinese thought the word brainwashing uh, was derived from the Buddhist expression heart washing? Isn't it also interesting that the Chinese people equated brainwashing with witchcraft. In reality, what Mr. Edward Hunter is describing is, a, a, uh, in many ways, a spiritual event. Brainwashing, in many ways, gets to the issue of spirituality. It is doing something, I believe, at the spiritual level with the mind and the heart and the soul. If you were to do an autopsy and someone were to ask you, show me the brain, well, they could show you the brain. But if someone were to ask you, show me the mind, they couldn't show you the mind. 
If someone were to say, show me the soul, you can't see the souls. Show me the spirit, you can't show them the spirit. Again, I could do an autopsy and, and show you a brain or take you into an autopsy and show you a brain, but I can't show you the mind. The mind is connected to the spiritual. The mind is connected to the heart and the soul, that which will live forever. And brainwashing goes to the very issue of the heart or the mind. So isn't it interesting that the Chinese believe the term brainwashing was connected to a, a Buddhist word and was connected to the word heart washing. They also believed it was similar to the spiritual practice of witchcraft. Now, why is this important? Well, the Bible mentions the heart 826 times. The Bible mentions the heart 826 times. Heart refers to the core of a person's being. In fact, in the Bible, the words heart and mind are often interchangeable. So when we talk about brainwashing, we're talking about the heart, the mind, something at the spiritual level. And indeed, I think it is something that is coming from the spiritual realm. In fact, Proverbs 4.23 declares that out of the heart springs the issues of life. In other words, from the heart proceed our good and bad thoughts, emotions, and behavior. Now, if you want to grab your Bible and go with me to Genesis chapter 3, let me set up for you why I believe brainwashing at its core is a spiritual issue that does indeed go after the heart and the mind. Let me also get, show you in Genesis 3 what I believe is the first information operation, the first attempt at brainwashing or mind washing or heart washing. Genesis chapter 3, here's what we read. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said? Wait a minute, let's just stop right there. One of the key things that a facilitator carrying out the goal of brainwashing must first do is to get an individual to doubt their own convictions. One of the first things we see going on, whether it is in the communist revolution of 1949 or the communist brainwashing techniques used on our POWs during the Korean War, they want people to doubt, to question their convictions, to question their worldview and their values, and thus to change their conduct. We know that your worldview is the foundation of your values, and your values is the foundation of your conduct. Thus, if they can get you to change your worldview, you'll change your values. You change your values, you're changing your conduct. And so, at the very premise of brainwashing is getting people to doubt their own convictions, to doubt what they believe, to doubt the foundation of their worldview. And here in Genesis chapter 3, Satan in the form of a serpent says to Eve, did God really say? Satan is trying to convince Eve to sin by not trusting God, to sin by disobeying God. But she first me must be convinced that God is not what he says he is. Eve must be convinced that it is acceptable to question her core convictions and values and worldview. Yes, Eve is being asked to question God. Did God really say? You see, brainwashing requires people to question their theology. The word theos, or God, is where we find the word theology. Theos, God, theology. Theology is, again, coming from this idea of theos, God. It is the study of God. And if you can get someone to change their view of God to there is no God or man is God, you have changed their theology. And once you get them to deny there is no God, as Frederick Nietzsche said, God is dead, or you get them to believe, as the New Age teaches, man is his 
own God, you now have gotten them to question, did God really say? And now the brainwashing operation can get underway. In other words, people must be involved not only in questioning absolute truth, questioning God, questioning their theology, they, all must, they also must be involved in what is called self-doubt. They, the, the facilitator of a brainwashing operation wants the subject to question their own beliefs. Well, maybe I have been wrong. Maybe I have been deceived. Maybe I have been manipulated. Maybe I have been used. Maybe I have been mistreated. Maybe I'm not being treated fairly. Maybe I have not been treated justly. And they're called to question even their own convictions, self-doubt, self-criticism. Maybe I wasn't being smart. Maybe I haven't been aware of what's been going on. Self-criticism, self-doubt. But ultimately the goal is for them to question their convictions, their worldview. And so this is what Satan is doing to Eve and he says, indeed, has God said, has God said you should not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Let's break that verse down real quick. You surely will not die. What is that? Well, that's the idea of, well, for the New Age movement, it would be reincarnation. Reincarnation, you won't die. Your, your soul will just be repeatedly passed from one body to another until your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. Your good karma outweighs your bad karma. You won't die. There, no, there won't be any spiritual death. There, there's no spiritual consequences to what I'm offering you. No, you surely will not die spiritually or physically. And if you do die physically, don't worry about it because you don't die spiritually. You can just be reprocessed through reincarnation until your good karma outweighs your bad karma as you continue up the process of reincarnation to something greater. You won't die. There'll be no spiritual death. And then Satan says to her, for God knows that in that day you eat up from it, your eyes will be open. What is this? This is the idea or the belief that you will have hidden knowledge. Your eyes will be opened. You'll have hidden knowledge, esotericism, hidden knowledge. Today, many seek hidden knowledge through drugs, through altered state of consciousness, through transcendental meditation, which is a new name for an old practice known as yoga. And in a minute, we're going to see that indeed the Maharashi and transcendental meditation that came to America through the Maharashi, has been a great way to brainwash the American people. And in fact, the KGB were quite excited that the Maharashi came to America to bring yoga under the new name of Transcendental Meditation. They believed, the KGB, that this idea that your eyes could be opened and you could have hidden knowledge would go a long way toward brainwashing the American people. Now, while the KGB didn't have anything really to do with it, according to the former KGB officer, they were quite happy to see it come to America because they thought it would play very nicely into the brainwashing of the American people. We'll look at that in just a minute. But isn't that what yoga is all about today as well? Your eyes will be open. You'll have some hidden knowledge through a spiritual experience as the natural world dissolves and you enter the spiritual world. You have new truth or reality created for you or made available to you. Gnosticism. Gnosticism is a, a, a definition that would be very lengthy, but in, in, in a basic term, it's the idea of pursuing hidden knowledge, Gnosticism, higher knowledge or hidden knowledge. And again, the thought is that can be do, done through drugs or hypnosis. 
many of the um, radicals of the 1960s wanted to have an altered state of consciousness. Remember the musical hair? This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius or the age of new beginnings. It's thought to be a new age where men will be more enlightened into understanding who they are, their godhood, their deity. It'll be a new age where man understands his deity. But to do that, they had to tap into their unconscious mind and have an altered state of consciousness to discover their godhood or their deity. And, and drugs was a great way to have that altered state of consciousness, they said. But some didn't want to do drugs. And then here comes the Maharashi offering up yoga under a new name, Transcendental Meditation. And this is right out of Genesis chapter 3. And then after Satan says, you will not die, and after he says, your eyes will be open, then he says, you will be like God. You will be like God. God. You will be your own God. Humanism. Humanism. You'll be your own God. Now, in our past studies, we know that there are two forms of humanism. There's secular humanism that says there is no God, there is no spiritual world, there's only the natural world, and in this life, you are your own God. You're God. You can do whatever you want. There's no right and wrong. You are in charge, but when you die, that's it. It's over. So secular humanism says man is God while he lives in this natural world, but when he dies, that's it. It's over. But while he is alive, he is the captain of his own future and destiny and the arbiter of what is right and wrong. He is God. Man is God. Secular humanism. Cosmic humanism, our new age, declares, unlike secular humanism, cosmic humanism declares... There is a spiritual world. In fact, it declares there is a spiritual world and there is a natural world. They believe that the natural world is really an illusion, and that's why many New Agers want to be involved in drugs or transcendental meditation or yoga and make the natural world dissolve and enter into the spiritual realm where they can understand their godhood or their deity and, and get their chakras in line and be more attuned with the, the cosmos where they find peace and bliss and can come together with other New Agers in a harmonic convergence and the power of the mind to create a heaven on earth, if you will. So both groups, secular humanists as well as cosmic humanists or New Agers, both declare that man is God. Secular humanists say man is God in the natural world till he dies and that's it. Cosmic humanists believe man is God and his spirit will live forever and where his spirit resides is dependent upon good karma, bad karma, good deeds, bad deeds, and the hierarchy of this ladder. But this is what Satan is saying to Eve, you will be like God. Then he says, you will know good from evil. You decide what is right and wrong. There, there is no such thing as absolute truth. There's no such thing as absolute truth, moral relativism, situational ethics. Today, we would call it postmodernism. Truth and reality are created by man, not by God. That's postmodernism. Right here in Genesis 3, I believe we're seeing the first information operation, the first brainwashing operation. And it began by Satan declaring to Eve, did God really say? Can you really trust God? Can you believe in His Word? Does He keep His Word? Can you believe in His promises? Maybe you've been lied to. Maybe you've been deceived. Maybe there's something better. Doubt what you believe. Self-doubt. Self-criticism is a part of it but at the very essence is questioning your foundational worldview and convictions. And indeed, that's what happened to the POWs in the Korean War. There began to be this self-doubt, self-criticism. Well, maybe I have been deceived by the folks back at home. Maybe the folks back at home have just used me as a dupe to send me over here to fight for this oppressive capitalist system. Maybe I have been deceived all along. Maybe nobody really cares back at home. Maybe they've gone on with their life and aren't even thinking of me anymore. Maybe my worldview based on God and country and patriotism has been a form of manipulation. 
All of these things were placed into the minds of the POWs of the Korean War as part of an operation to get them to doubt their core beliefs or convictions. But what the studies by people like William Mayer found out is that, unfortunately, many of our American POWs of the 1950s Korean War, well, they didn't really know what they believed. In other words, they didn't have too many convictions. And as we have seen in past studies, a lot of this started to occur in our schools in the 1940s, when America's textbooks began to come under great uh, uh, manipulation by globalists, by collectivists, by wealthy foundations who were busy using their money to get textbooks of America rewritten to not teach individuality, to not teach the responsibility of the individual, to not teach about our constitutional republic, to not teach absolute truth, but instead to, to teach collectivism, to teach the idea of progressive ideas or socialism or collective salvation, the group, group consensus. And this was in the 1940s. And this involved even a congressional study and research known as the Reese Committee. And this committee in the 1940s found out that these liberal, globalist, progressive, socialist foundations were starting to influence what was going on, what was being written in our curriculum of our schools in America in the 1940s, which thus produced the men of the 1950s who really didn't know what they should know about America, our constitutional republic, our form of government, our economy, how it works. So they could have indeed deep convictions about our way of life. And the Chinese found out very quickly, they don't know much. They're easily manipulated. We can get them to doubt their American way of life. We can get them to doubt their American values and ideas and to question and doubt their own government. You see, again, that self-doubt, that self-criticism, that getting people to reject their core convictions is key in the beginning process of an information operation or of brainwashing. Here is the statement of Ed Hunter on March 13th, 1958, before the U United States Congressional Committee on Un-American Activities. He said, quote, no man has ever been brainwashed whose mind has not first been put into a fog. Well, isn't that interesting? Isn't that what drugs largely do to the brain? A fog? In reality, isn't that what much of the spiritual practices of yoga or transcendental meditation do to people, put their mind in a fog, not bringing clarity of thought, not really bringing a, um, a uh, emphasis on logic or context or reason, but really having them involved in a, 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 a fog. So this is what he said, no man has ever been brainwashed whose mind has not first been put into a fog. The patient first has to be deprived of his bearings, to be shaken loose from whatever belief and convictions he formerly held until he loses faith in them entirely, end quote. Notice that line again, shaken loose from whatever, whatever belief and convictions he formerly held again. One of the very first steps of brainwashing is to get them to question their world view, to question and to doubt their own convictions. Here is a picture of Yuri Bezmenov. You can go on YouTube and listen to many hours of him teaching, and I would highly recommend that you do that. He's a former KGB officer that defected. And he sat in interviews with G. Edward Griffin. You'll find his interview in, uh, from one of those interviews from 1984 on YouTube, as I said, that you can watch. And there are many of him where he's speaking. And as a former KGB officer, he is describing brainwashing, among other things. And he declares that there are four major steps to brainwashing. Demoralization, destabilization, chaos, and the new norm. Demoralization, 
destabilization, chaos, and the new norm. Demoralization involves exactly what we've been saying, getting people to reject absolute truth, to reject the foundational worldview of their nation, to reject a Judeo-Christian ethic and worldview in the case of America. America has been founded on a Judeo-Christian ethic deriving largely from the Old Testament, in part, ju thus the Judeo-Christian ethic. And as Yuri has said, the goal is to demoralize, take away morality, absolute truth. And when you do that, that creates chaos. So you demoralize and you destabilize. So you demoralize and that creates a destabilization. The destabilization that comes because of the lack of morality, the increase of crime, the breakdown of the family, the increase in divorce, children born out of wedlock, uh, the welfare state, all of this is due to the demoralization period. So you have demoralization, destabilization, and eventually that creates the chaos. Uh, my friends, I believe that right now, here in February of 2019, we, we are in the chaos stage. We are in the chaos stage. Uh, we're seeing things happen in America that many of us never believed we would see. Uh, we're seeing things such as uh, sex change operations for children as young as five years of age that's already been tried in a hospital on the East Coast. Sex change operations for children as young as five. Here we are today where we have not the male gender and the female gender, but multiple genders and fluity and so many genders, it's impossible to keep up with anymore. We're also to the point now where these ideas that are, have been shocking to us as American people have made their way into, well, evangelicalism, to churches. And so the chaos has touched all the areas, media, education, and religion. And indeed, as we'll see tonight, these are three of the most powerful centers that must be penetrated for brainwashing to be successful. Education, media, and religion. And Yuri uh, Bizanov, the former KGB officer said, you demoralize, you destabilize, that creates the chaos. And after enough chaos, the people will embrace socialism. They'll embrace the revolution within their country. They will cry out for the government to stop the chaos, to bring some stability and some peace and some security. Ben Franklin, I believe it was, is the one who said that the people that give up their liberty for a little bit of security are worthy of neither and lose both. So we now are seeing that Yuri Bezanov's predictions from the 1980s, 1984, are coming true. He said, quote, the KGB was even curious about this gentleman, Maharashi Mahaji Yogi, a great spiritual leader or maybe a great charlatan and crook, depending on from which side you're looking at him. The Beatles were trained at his ashram in Hardwar in India and in how to meditate. Mia Farrow and other useful idiots from Hollywood visited his school and they returned back to the United States absolutely zonked out of their minds with marijuana, hashish, and crazy ideas of meditation. To meditate, in other words, he said, to isolate oneself from the current social and political issues of your own country, to get into your own bubble, to forget about the troubles of the world. Obviously, the KGB was very fascinated with such a beautiful school such a brainwashing center for stupid Americans. He said, I was dispatched by the KGB to check out or check into what kind of VIP Americans attend this school. You see, a person who is too much involved in introspective meditation, you see, if you carefully look at what the Maharashi Mashi Yogi is teaching is to Americans, it is that most of the problems, most of the burning issues of today can be solved simply by meditating. Don't rock the boat. Don't get involved. Just sit down, look at your navel, 
and meditate. And the things, due to some strange logic, due to cosmic vibration, will settle down by themselves. This is exactly what the KGB and Marxist, Leninist propaganda want from Americans. To distract their opinion, attention, and mental energy from the real issues of the United States into non-issues, into a non-world, non-existent harmony. Obviously, it's more beneficial for the Soviet aggressors to have a bunch of duped Americans than Americans who are self-conscious, healthy, physically fit, and alert to the reality. Maharashi Ashi Yogi obviously is not on the payroll of the KGB, but whether he knows it or not, he contributes greatly to the demoralization of American society. And he's not the only one. There are hundreds of those gurus who come to your country to capitalize on the negativity and stupidity of Americans. It's a fashion. It's a fashion to meditate. It's a fashion not to be involved. So obviously you can see that if the KGB were that curious, if they paid for my trip to Hardawar, if they assigned me to that strange job, obviously they were very much fascinated. They were convinced that the type of brainwashing is very efficient and instrumental in the demoralization of the United States. My friends, this is exactly why I laid out for you his four steps that the KGB sought to bring about to overthrow a country. Demoralize, destabilize, chaos, and now the new norm. The new norm being the utopia of Marxism. But he says that yoga, this spiritual practice of yoga, was used during the and was, well, applauded by the KGB and the Soviet Union as very effective in helping them with the demoralization of America, even though they had nothing to do with it. Why? Because it taught people not to pay attention to what's going on. If you want the natural world to dissolve and to enter the spiritual world where you can get your chakras in a line and find peace and harmony and your deity discover that you're God, maybe perhaps even to meet a spirit or master guide, because after all, a spirit or master guide is an individual who has died and through the process of reincarnation has become more highly evolved and they become a spirit or master guide and they can help you through life. And New Agers openly admit that the most popular way to meet a spirit or master guide is through drugs or hypnosis, things like transcendental meditation or yoga. So they would much rather, the KGB, have Americans not thinking about what's happening in the world. Global politics, geopolitics, the Cold War, armament, nuclear war. They don't want you thinking about these things. They don't want you thinking about how the KGB are working in America to overthrow your way of government, your way of life, infiltrating your institutions, religion, education, and media. They don't want you paying any attention to that. They would rather you go into the spiritual and not listen to the negative so that you could enter the spiritual without any distraction while they take over your country. Oftentimes today, what do we hear American Christians say? Well, well I just can't listen to that Brandon House. He's, he's doom and gloom. Well, all we're doing is telling you what's happening, okay? Uh, it's not doom and gloom if you believe in what the Bible says is the ultimate culmination of the world. For Christians, it's not doom and gloom. It, the Bible calls it our blessed hope, the return of Christ to take away his church, his bride, to live with him forever. But we do know that Jesus himself said to his disciples in Matthew 24 that many bad things will occur prior to this, but yet he said to his disciples, I've told you these things must happen so you will not fear. And yet, Many people cannot seem to gather together the spiritual wherewithal to gird up the loins of their mind to understand and to listen to what's happening in the world without filling themselves with fear. And therefore, they don't want to hear it. 
And so they say it's doom and gloom and I don't want to pay attention. I don't want to read his books. I don't want to listen to his radio show. I don't want to watch his TV show. Well, they're playing right into the hands of the revolutionaries. They don't want you to know any of the warnings we're giving. They don't want you to know any of the warnings that I'm giving you. And that indeed is what yoga is also all about. Entering the spiritual, not listening to anything negative so that you can come in to the spiritual and align your chakras and come to a peace and a tranquility to make the natural world dissolve and enter the spiritual realm. And so isn't it interesting that this spiritual practice of yoga was said by the former KGB officer, Mr. Yuri, to be productive to the demoralization stage of the former Soviet Union. This yoga and transcendental meditation was very much complementary to set up the brainwashing of the American people, a spiritual practice, which goes back to the point we're making earlier, that really at its heart, brainwashing was more accurately called heart washing, heart washing. And your heart or your mind is part of your spiritual being. Your brain is not part of your spiritual being. Your mind is, your heart is, your brain is simply gray matter. It's part of the natural world. When you die, your spirit will leave, the brain matter will remain. Again, if I do an autopsy, I can show you the brain, but I cannot show you the mind. And here it is, the spiritual practice of yoga, the spiritual practice of transcendental meditation was seen as being very productive to the heart washing, the mind washing, what we know as brain washing, as part of fulfilling the stage of demoralization for the Soviet Union in their four-step process of demoralization, destabilization, chaos, and the new norm of Marxism-Leninism. It's a, it's a spiritual operation. And that's so interesting because today, secular humanism is no longer the dominant worldview in America, thus making the brainwashing much more likely. Did you understand what I just said? Cosmic humanism is really now the dominant worldview. New Age thinking. Postmodernism would be right there with it. But Secular humanism certainly is not the dominant worldview. Secular humanism said that through human reason, man can solve his own problems. Through human reason, man can solve his own problems. Well, that didn't work out so well, did it? We had World War I, we had World War II, and war after war, it hasn't worked out so well. Secular humanism is no longer the dominant worldview. One reason why is because people realize they are indeed spiritual beings. Where the secular humanist said there is no such thing as the, as the spiritual world, people know instinctively there is a spiritual world, that they are made up of both natural and spiritual. And they want a spiritual experience. Why do they want a spiritual experience? Because they want something they want a spiritual salve for their guilty conscience. Why is their conscience guilty? Romans 1, 2, and 3 says their conscience is guilty because the moral law, the character and nature of God, is placed on their heart and mind. Con means with, science means knowledge. They sin with the knowledge. They offend a holy and just God, and thus they feel guilty. Romans says they are without excuse because the moral law is written on their heart and their mind at the spiritual level, their heart and their mind. And they want a spiritual salve for their guilty conscience. Thus, secular humanism offered nothing for that because it denied the spiritual realm. The New Age movement, which emphasizes the spiritual realm, which people today desire to have a spiritual experience for a couple reasons. One, a spiritual salve for their guilty conscience. And secondly, they want a spiritual experience because they've been told that through spiritual experiences, they can discover the meaning and purpose of life. They can discover hidden knowledge. And what is life really all about? Otherwise, without that, there seems to be no point to life. A nihilism or nihilism. Life has no ultimate meaning. But if you believe in a spiritual world and a spiritual salve for your guilty conscience and a spiritual practice that opens your eyes to hidden knowledge or higher knowledge, now you can begin, begin to understand what is the purpose of life. 
And so spirituality solves two problems for sure. It gives them a spiritual salve to supposedly soothe their guilty conscience and spiritual cravings, and it also hopes to give them answers to life. And so here in America today, secular humanism has faded away. Cosmic humanism, new age, thanks to people like Oprah Winfrey and others, is, is quite the dominant worldview and will only increase with the idea of pantheism, all is God, panentheism, God is in all, Mother Earth, we're all part of one. And as this increases, more and more people are practicing yoga. And as they practice yoga and they no longer want to hear programs like this, they don't want to know what's going on in America. They don't want to know what's going on in the world because it'll kill their buzz. It'll keep them from getting their chakras in a line and having a peace and tranquility and discovering their spirituality and having that hidden knowledge. So they reject the things of reason and logic and context and understanding of the times. And thus, can you imagine how the former Soviet Union and Putin and all of his still FSB friends, formerly the KGB, if his FSB friends are ecstatic that yoga is more the rage today than it was in 1984 when the former uh, KGB officer Yuri was speaking, because that means the brainwashing of Americans is more likely to lead to the demoralization and the destabilization of America because they're not paying attention to the issues of the day. In fact, they have been taught if they do, it'll disrupt their spiritual progress. Wow. Timothy Leary recalls in a piece titled Flashback, a conversation he had with Aldous Huxley. Huxley said, quote, these brain drugs mass produced in the laboratories will bring vast changes in society. This will happen with or without you or me. All we can do is spread the word. The obstacle to this evolution, Timothy, is the Bible. End quote. Let me just stop right there. What is the opposition? What is the obstacle to the brainwashing, to the mind revolution? the Bible, that again, Judeo-Christian worldview, absolute truth, a belief in God, right and wrong. Th this is the obstacle. But what were they doing? They were looking to drugs to have an altered state of consciousness. Yes, indeed, people can have this altered state of consciousness through yoga or transcendental meditation, or they can do it through drugs. And again, that is why drugs were so prevalent during the 60s for many people was because they were seeking that altered state of consciousness. Now, those that didn't want to do the drugs would turn to the Maharashi and Transcendental Meditation, the new name for an old practice known as yoga. But Timothy Leary and Aldous Huxley are again talking about how drugs will help bring about this mind revolution. But that the Bible, the Judeo-Christian worldview is the obstacle. To which Leary responded, quote, we had run up against the Judeo-Christian commitment to one God, one religion, one reality that has cursed Europe for centuries and America since our founding days. Drugs that open the mind to multiple realities inevitably lead to a polytheistic view of the universe. We sense that the time for a new humanist, humanist religion based on intelligence, good-natured pluralism, and scientific paganism has arrived, end quote. What does he mean by drugs that open the mind to multiple realities and inevitably lead to polytheistic view of the universe? Polytheistic, po many gods, many gods. A, f a new humanist religion based on intelligence, good-natured pluralism, pluralism, all religions are equal. And then a scientific paganism. Uh, this is really, again, the promotion of what we see as dominating the world today that I call one world spirituality. One world spirituality. And we'll get into that later in our study. In her book, Aquarian Conspiracy, author Marilyn Ferguson, this is a very popular New Age book, Marilyn Ferguson affirmed another New Age writer when she quoted them as declaring, quote, LSD gave a whole generation a religious experience, end quote. Now, as we look to conclude tonight, let me just share with you what I'm going to be sharing with you in, in depth in our coming classes.
and broadcast. You know the old saying is, tell people what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Well, let me tell you what it is I'm going to be telling you in the coming days of this broadcast. I'm going to break it down in points tonight, but in our subsequent programs, we will go into great detail under each point. Here, my friends, quickly are the systematic steps of brainwashing that I have come up with from my own study. This is original research. We'll watch and see how long it takes some of these uh, bloggers to rip off my research, as they're prone to doing. Within three minutes to three hours or three days, a lot of this ends up on other people's website with no credit, but that's just because these are Romans 1 debased fools. But you'll be watching because this is all original research. These points are not coming from anyone or anywhere else other than from hours and hours of reading how the brainwashing went on, both with the communist Chinese in the 1949 communist revolution on their own people, and then also onto our POWs during the Korean War. Here quickly are the systematic steps of brainwashing. One, remove our discredit leaders that are principled, courageous, and people of convictions and morality. Two, entice the brainwashing subjects into questioning and doubting their foundational worldview, values, and convictions. Three, teach moral relativism and situational ethics in order to destroy morality. Four, teach the importance of group consensus and collectivism and the danger and consequences of individuality. Five, set up a system of rewards, honor, recognition, and advancement for those that embrace the worldview and values of the brainwashing program. Six, apply punitive consequences on any worldview and values that are contrary to the chosen worldview and values being inculcated into the brainwashing subjects. Seven, teach a revisionist history that portrays America's capitalist free market system as the source of all suffering and oppression. Eight, use informants, gossips, and tattletales to report on non-compliance of individuals and groups. Nine, use individuals in trusted institutions and occupations to give credibility to the worldview and values being inculcated into the brainwashing subjects. Ten, create an atmosphere and environment of chaos, suffering, hopelessness, and danger, and then rescue the subjects from this condition so that the persecutor is perceived as being a friend and protector. And then, my friends, I will take you next week and show you the parts of a killing machine when assembled, what that killing machine looks like. Now, my friends, this takes a lot of study, a lot of work. I'm talking hours. And this broadcast also costs a lot to distribute. We have to have a live streaming uh, contract to do this. We signed just about two weeks ago a contract with a new streaming service that went online today. We finally got everything moved over to it. It cost us $2,000 a month. We signed a year contract. That's $24,000 for you to be able to stream all of the content that we have at Worldview Radio and WVW TV, whether it's on your iPhone, your iPad, your Android, your computer, or Roku. In fact, this new system knows which one you're using. We've never had a system like this. It breaks it into little packets and sends it to you and sends it to you at the, the right bandwidth based on the uh, device you're using, be it a phone, a uh, phone, or a, a laptop, or a computer, or an iPad, it knows what your bandwidth is, and it will grab the appropriate size file and send to you. This is very expensive. For the $24,000 just for this, so you can watch free programs that we give away as ministry. How do we pay for all this? Well, one big way is through those of you that partner with us through the Worldview Weekend Foundation. Worldview Weekend Foundation is a tax-deductible organization, and you can make a tax-deductible contribution at wvwfoundation.com. You'll also find our mailing address there as well as our phone number, wvwfoundation.com. So if you appreciate the hours I spend studying and developing these PowerPoint slides and bringing this to you, how is it that I can do this? Because you support what we do. Otherwise, folks, I got to go somewhere else and do something else, run a business, start a business, do something different. So if you want this to continue, not only the studying and bringing it to you, but then the expense of producing it and streaming it and putting it out there, you must partner with us. We don't have big foundations that support us. We have people who give $10, $20, $30, $40. Some give more that are generous, but we don't have any big foundations. George Soros isn't backing us. The Rockefellers aren't backing us. We have people like you. So it's vital that you support what we're doing with a tax-deductible contribution at wvwfoundation.com. And again, you'll find our mailing address there if you prefer to send a check. 
Now, next Sunday night, we'll pick it back up with our next program in a series that's going to be rather lengthy as we understand brainwashing America, the systematic steps that have been used on the American people to get them to go along and to assist in the cultural Marxist revolution that is almost complete in the United States of America. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being interested in these issues. Thank you for being people that think. Thank you also for your prayers. And till next time, I'm Brandon House. Thanks for watching. Take care.